If it's Tuesday night and you're within the sound of my voice, then it must be time for Mission Log Live. I'm Ken Ray. And I'm John Champion. Each week on Mission Log Live, you, yes, you, are the star. You call us. You chime in with your questions and comments. Tonight, we welcome a very special guest, Doug Drexler. He is a Star Trek fan turned Star Trek professional. He's contributed so much to Trek over the years, starting with The Next Generation, and we wanted to chat with him about the many ways he influenced Trek and Trek influenced him. We'll explore that and so much more, and we'll talk about whatever else you want. We are here for you. Now you can click to join our Zoom meeting, or you can use the one tap from your smartphone. You can even call us the old-fashioned way. Dial us at 646-558-8656 and enter the meeting code that you will find in the show description and the comments. We do want to thank everybody who is joining us tonight. If you're catching the video show later, you are either watching on Facebook or on YouTube at youtube.com slash Roddenberry Prod. We like to tell you what's going on with you in case you've forgotten. Now, if you're listening, uh, you may be one of those uh, places that I just mentioned with your eyes closed, or you may have found the audio feed for this show. If you would like to find the audio feed for this show, go to iTunes, go to the Google Play Store, uh, go wherever you go for podcasts and grab us by the files, won't you? Oh, and yes, there is one other place that we can and do suggest, podcast.roddenberry.com. We'll be telling you more about that a bit later in the show. Uh, if you are uh, where you are right now, though, and liking things matters, uh, just go ahead and uh, tap share and tap like if you're on Facebook. Or, you know, you can like us on YouTube as well. Um, because, you know, if you share us, then we can share with more people. And it's like those uh, dirty space hippies from that episode of that show that time. Oh, those guys? I mean, come on. I know. I thought we were through with them. Yeah. Never, never. Yeah. By the way, everybody's chiming in now. It's really good to see some familiar faces there. Donna, Chuck, Paul, they all say hi and good to be here. And there's Meredith chiming in. Casey Shafsky, the one and only Casey Shafsky. I love, I love when you do this. It's like romper room. I know, right? It's, it's, but it's, kind of yeah. grown up. Especially with Casey in the room. Uh, and Wes Huntington. Hi, guys. Had a horrible cabin fever last weekend. Massive snowstorm in Minneapolis. Guess what I did? Listen to Mission Log. Well, that that's that's very nice. I'm I'm glad that we could be there to uh, to comfort you during the snowstorm, Wes. Will Wright. Hello, guys. Good evening. By the way, YouTube is live. Yes, yes, we know that YouTube is live. Thank you, uh, Brett Dean and uh, William and Kim. Just so many people joining us for the live show. Good to see you all. And uh, I I know for certain that you'll have questions and comments for Doug. So now is the time to chime in. Call us, use that Zoom link, or call 646-558-8656. Now is the time to start chiming in so we have good questions for Doug. But before we do that, we do like to visit the poll. Yes. And can you let us know about the poll last week, and then we'll find out what it's all about this week. Uh, sure, why not? Uh, last week, the question that we had, are you excited to see Captain Pike? On the next uh, on the next season of Discovery, because of course we got the news last week that Ensign Mount had been cast as Captain Pike. Uh, so it seems like he's probably going to be a big deal. Uh, he's a big deal to everybody who took the poll. Well, not everybody, but almost seventy nine percent of people said yes, they are excited to see Captain Pike. Twenty one percent of people said no. It's those twenty one percent of people that I'm curious about. Like, are they just not excited, or are they actually angry? But, you know, then we'd have to have like a sub poll, which we're not doing because we are now on to other things. Well, it's kind of funny. We we got some interesting feedback and had an interesting discussion around that last week, trying to figure out uh, where they went wrong with Pike. It, it wasn't so much that we were upset to see Pike. It's just don't mess up Pike. Don't bring him back just to kill him, and, you know, like the, the way they yeah. did in the movie. So, um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that was sort of uh, a good context to put it in. Now, um, this, oh, oh, by the way, I do have to say that uh, one of my friends who's watching right now, Meredith, uh, had posted, I think that day or maybe the next day, I don't know how to feel about this news about Captain Pike. And I chimed in and said, uh, you feel excited about this. Let me just clear <laughs> this up. And you, you're, you're 
very happy about this. The Captain Pike will be back, played by Anson Mount. That's the the primary thing there. This week's poll, kind of a weird question, not specific to um, not specific to Star Trek, but you'll figure out why in a moment when we bring in our guest. This week's question: Ever been to a World's Fair? Right now, the split is exactly the way it was with our Captain Pike poll. 21% of you say yes, 79% of you say no. Ken, no. have you been to uh, a world? Oh, oh no, was... I'm sorry. Yeah, we have the opposite, right? Yeah. Yes, it's the opposite. Right. Same numbers, but in a different order. Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah, 79% yeah, yeah. are saying they ha Oh, you're killing me. The numbers yeah. are all over the place. <laughs> you asked if I had been to a World's Fair. Uh, yes. yes, although I've been to a World's Fair that at the time was deemed... Yeah, fine. I mean, it was um, so apparently there are different classifications of World's Fairs, or at least there used to be. I don't even know if they still have them now. But the one uh, 1983, they had a World's Fair over in Knoxville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, yeah, I got over there for one day. I think it was fifth or sixth grade. It was a fifth or sixth grade trip. Um, everybody was really excited about the rides. I don't remember a single pavilion. I mean, I remember there being pavilions, but I don't remember. I remember very little of it because I think it was like fifth grade, like I say, fifth or sixth, maybe. What about you? Yeah, I, I, the, the main one, the big one that I went to was 1984 in New Orleans. Hmm. And uh, or wait, it, hang on, it might have been 86. No, I think it was 84. And that was in New Orleans. Uh, yeah, kind of on. I, I realized, yeah. too, that I just said 83. It was actually 82. It was the 1982 World Fair in Knoxville. Yeah, My bad. Yeah. Um, so I, I did go to the one in New Orleans, uh, interesting design, what on the, right on the waterfront. Water is a big theme of that fair. And, uh, of course, you and I have both been to Epcot, which is the, the Disney sort of reinvention of the World's Fair. That was the inspiration for that theme park. So well, it was. Uh, yeah, it, it was. It's been changing. We do a whole show about how it's been changing. Um, but yeah, the, the split right now. So it's the same numbers, but reverse. So 20, 21 percent of you say, yes, you've been to a fair. 79, 80 percent of you say, no, you have not been to a World's Fair. It's something that's kind of fallen out of favor. There's just not really the attention on those the way that there used to be. And uh, we're going to talk about that and uh, the design elements of fairs with our guest when he chimes in. That'll be Doug Drexler. So, and I see that already people are, uh, are, are bringing up comments that they want us to, uh, to talk to Doug about. But that sets the stage a little bit of uh, one of the topics that we will be discussing. So without further ado, why don't we welcome our guest? As I mentioned before, he is a Star Trek fan turned Star Trek professional, and he has worked in many capacities and many iterations of Star Trek, starting out with makeup, working in the art department, doing a, a tremendous amount of design. I he made is, a pig of myself. <laughs> he, he is Star really Trek's did. renaissance man. He is Doug Drexler, and we're very glad to welcome him here. Hey, How are you doing tonight, Doug? It's great to be here. No, really, I'm one of the luckiest Star Trek fans who ever lived. I mean, to be on the show and do one thing would have been enough. But you see, one of the beautiful things about that era of Star Trek was that you had this family of people who were there for like 18 years. And they looked after each other. And it really was a family, you know. Uh, but to... Uh, to, to, to be a part of that, just as a makeup artist alone, is pretty freaking cool. But when, you, when, you're, when a lot of people are together for that long and you all get to know each other, it actually becomes easier to go sideways. Like I guess get to know Michael Kuda. We, turns out we like each other, have a lot in common, and I slide into the art department and, as a scenic artist, as an illustrator. And then if you're going to be in the art department, see, the, one of the big differences about then was that we were all on the Paramount lot or within a few miles. And that meant visual effects and the sets and the writers and the wardrobe. It was all there, you know? And now what's happening is that the film business is being spread out around the world. You know, you might shoot it in Toronto or you might shoot in Vancouver and your visual effects may be spread out amongst a bunch of different vendors. It's like the whole complexion of how a show is made has really changed a lot. But we had that wonderful close knit family behind the camera. And that allowed me 
to move around and get to do a lot of different things. And who wants to do one thing anyway when you have all this, you know, these delicious pastries all over? Who wants just one, you know? <laughs> right, right. All right, so let, let's talk about, uh, speaking of art direction, you have a bit of art direction happening right now in your office. You have themed it appropriately <laughs> to our discussion. So behind you, for those of uh, our, our listeners uh, in the days coming who, who are not maybe watching but listening, you have a sign behind you from the 1964 World's Fair. You yes. also have, uh, right behind you over the other shoulder, <laughs> you have the, uh, the U.S. Royal tires oh, uh, yeah. a, a maquette yeah i've got models of the pavilions that i had that have, are handmade by a guy as a matter of fact if we're going to talk about world's fairs maybe i should mm -hmm. say this story but uh when i went to the new york world's fair and i was 11 years old uh and i practically lived there like twice a week for two summers my father would drop me off at the main gate and and i'd be there all day long by myself uh so I, I I literally lived at this fair and it had a huge influence on me and on Star Trek. I mean, really, the New York World's Fair is ground zero for the original series and what followed design ethic. And we always used to sneak the wor New York World's Fair into the shows like Deep Space Nine. And uh, uh, even, you know, when we we did, you know, I would put pavilions in the city mm -hmm. from the World's Fair. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, you know, I could. I'm sorry, I could get out of control here and not be able to shut up. So just, you know, give me a. No, I, 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 this is why we have you because you you are an expert in your field <laughs> and. And that, for those of you who, who maybe wondered why we started the discussion about World's Fairs, that's why. And, and to me, the interesting thing here is that th there's not just the design language that you use from that fair that showed up throughout Star Trek. And, and before your time on Star Trek, it was a design language that was influencing what happened in the original series as well, very profoundly. But there's also something to me thematically about the world's fairs that permeate what happens in Star Trek. Um, it, there's some, yeah, we, we can be very cynical and we can look at the world's fairs as sort of a, a, a marketplace and a, and a capitalistic expression. But there is something, uh, if you kind of put on your non-cynical hat for a moment, that is about exploring the future and trying Absolutely. to figure out what our relationship to the future will be. Absolutely. Star Trek and the, and especially, world, well, big world's fairs, even the 39, but especially the 1964 New York World's Fair um, and Star Trek. See, from <laughs> not <laughs> the world's fair, imagine this, okay? Picture, now there's world's fairs and then there's world's fairs, okay? Yeah. New York yeah. World's Fair. We're talking bigger than Disney World. I mean, huge, the number of buildings and pavilions. And as a matter of fact, the New York World's Fair was a test balloon for Walt Disney, as far as Disney, even doing Disney World. And there are elements of the 64 World's Fair in Disney World and Disneyland today. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, but the thing was that, okay, imagine that Walt Disney said, you know, I'm gonna build Disneyland in Queens, New York, the whole thing, but it's only going to be there for two years. At the end of two years, we're going to take it all apart. <laughs> I mean, is that insane or what? But it was a unique moment in time. There was this, you know, uh, post-war optimism and industrial boom that was going on. Uh, and companies like General Motors and Ford and General Electric and uh, DuPont. And the, remember, the World War II was only like 20 years before. A lot of the world had been flattened and American industry was booming and they had money to burn, basically. And just go on the internet and Google 1964 New York World's Fair and hit the pictures button and look at some of these structures and buildings. The General Motors building is it's just a work of art. And we use it uh, at Starfleet. All the time. I always put the, the GM Pavilion, you know, <laughs> at Starfleet. As See, that to me... Fact, Go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say that to me is one of the most interesting things about the um, about the thirty nine World's Fair. It's been, and I haven't studied it the way you know the sixty four World's Fair, having you know actually you know walked around it for two summers every day. 
But I mean, to me, it was always sort of an interesting thing because, okay, we've just come out of the Great Depression. We're just about to go into World War II here in the States. I mean, other parts of the world, obviously, were already embroiled. Um, but there, I mean, there really is, I mean, there's this, there's this like, you know, two year period where you have this like, you know, shining future idea that people can go and walk around and then go even more microcosmically uh, in 1940 when there's like, no, we got to keep this going. Then it just like turns the, incredible. The world was on the precipice. I mean, yeah. uh, of chaos and cataclysm. Yeah. yeah. You, what are, you, I mean, the world's fairs are usually so optimistic. You were telling me something really interesting, though, about the differences in design that I didn't know about between the 39 and the 64. Well, the thing about the 1939 fair, and if you watch a movie like um, Shape of Things to Come or even Elements of Metropolis, you'll see this look of the future that w was accepted in 1938, 1939, men wearing togas <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So when they, when they designed the 1939 World's Fair, and Google that too, it's really fascinating to look at because if you look at the 64 and you look at the 38, 39 side by side, it's like a time war because the layout of the 64 fair is exactly the layout of the 39 world's fair. Because when they did the 64, that they did it in the same place in Flushing mm -hmm. Meadows in Queens. And they said, we've already got the utilities laid out. So that's, that's the reason. Uh, but it's fascinating to look at. But what you're talking about is that there was a, I guess they probably had a board of directors as far as the look. Everyone has to submit what the pavilions are going to look like. <clears throat> the 39 World's Fair uh, was had an aesthetic that ran through the entire fair from ev almost every building. They all looked like shape of things to come. Mm -hmm. Where the 64 World's Fair was more eclectic uh, and I think much more exciting and more joyful when you look at it. Um, but uh, w what you were saying about, I went to the 64 for two years. I watched them building it because I, I drive by there with my father. I was collecting pictures out of, you know, newspapers and stuff. Then I spent two, two summers there by myself. And in 19, at the end of 1965, I had to watch them take it apart, brick by brick, piece by piece. Oh, you know, these fairs have also been featured in, you know, Captain America and Iron Man. And Captain America, he, they go to the 39 World's Fair. Tony Stark has the Stark Exposition in the New York mm -hmm. State Pavilion, no less, which is still there, one of the few remaining buildings. And uh, uh, what was the name of the director? Uh, the guy who directed Iron Man. I know one of you guys knows. Oh, uh, uh, John Favreau. Uh, yeah, F Favreau, yeah. a mm -hmm. massive 1964 New York World's Fair fan. And if you look at the name of his production company, it's uh, Fairview. <laughs> right. So he he uses, all, and also, uh, here I go again, can't remember the name, the director of Men in Black, which Son had. Of um, yeah. Yeah. Son of yeah. yeah. Son of at the end, they go to the fair site and they climb up the New York State Towers and the saucer crashes through the Unisphere. This is another right. guy who was there the same time I was, who was blown away by the 64 New York World's Fair. Not to mention Matt Jeffries. Ah, okay, Star yeah, of the course. Director from the original Star Trek. Yeah. Who, you know, we got to know quite well and was like an, an uncle. Um, I always knew, I could always see the connection. They, 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 in 1965, the end of 65, they took the, tore this whole place down flat to the earth. And I watched that and it broke my heart. And one year later, Star Trek premiered. And that was my consolation prize for the New York World's Fair. It was this thing about exploring and optimism and enjoyed technology. And you could see that they actually thought about it. Uh, I, I identified with the show instantly. And to me, it was like a on the air New World's Fair. Look at all the things that we saw on the enterprise that we have today. You know, it was the same for the for the, the World's Fair. Um, well, so, let, let me ask you this, because I, I, I am curious about some of those little design details and Easter eggs you left. But but before we even talk about that, I want to know, uh, you said you were 11 years old. You went twice a week, every week over the summer for two years. Um, what did that fair tell you about the future? What did it tell an 11-year-old Doug Drexler that, 
that you were able to wrap your mind around and say, yes, that's the world that I want to live in. That's the future that, that we can and should work toward. Because we hear from Star Trek fans who say that's what they get out of Star Trek. It's that aspirational idea. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The thing was, for me, though, um, the, the stuff I saw at the World's Fair came as no surprise to me. I was a huge science fiction reader. I read voraciously. I read all the classic. I read every Edgar Rice Burroughs book, H.G. Wells. Uh, all I knew about all this stuff. And when I went to the New York World's Fair, it was like kindred spirits. I'm like, oh, they're speaking my language here. What the New York World's Fair told me that was a revelation was that somebody's making this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is making this as a job. And I think that may have been one of the first times I even thought well, of course, uh, you know, I was reading Stan Lee back in the early 60s, 1962, 1963. And I also knew that here was another adult who was, who was earning a living by doing stuff that my parents thought was childish. And I wanted a piece of that. <laughs> you know? But it's the same for the World's Fair. I mean, here are, if you, if you could actually, I'm amazed that there's so little really it's hard to believe that so far I've yet to discover that anybody has taken any really terrific footage of the fair and of rides and things like that. Uh, everything that I've ever seen, and you go on YouTube, it's all pretty degraded. Mm -hmm. But man, it was spectacular stuff. And, they, you know, it was kind of like, like General Motors, which is the Futurama. It was kind of like the, the Haunted Mansion. But about the world of tomorrow. Imagine a haunted mansion, but it's about the world of tomorrow. They take you to a moon <laughs> right. base. They take you under the sea. You're riding into chairs. You go into, I mean, it, for an 11-year-old, see, that's what's really interesting. One of the things I'm getting into lately is uh, immersive VR. I'm doing a lot of VR. As a matter of fact, we're even exhibiting a couple of VR pieces in Cannes in May. Mm. So that's really exciting. But the nice. thing is, nice. when I make this stuff, that was immersive virtual reality when I was a kid. They put you on a chair with a motor on it and <laughs> sail you through like 12 really amazing, you know, uh, dioramas of cities of tomorrow and, and things like that. I, and now I, I'm doing virtual reality stuff and I feel like I'm designing world's fair pavilions because I take people through experiences almost the same way, except they're not sitting in a motorized chair, <laughs> but uh, there I go blathering again. I, you know, really, I, I, the World's Fair and Star Trek are like in my DNA, and I, they're very connected to me, and, uh, and I see them as being very connected. And I knew that Matt Jeffries was influenced, even as a kid. I knew it, and when I finally got to know, I remember telling Mike Okuda, "I'm telling you, Mike." The World's Fair is ground zero for Star Trek design ethic. You're like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I'll bet you anything Matt Jeffries went, yeah, yeah, okay, Doug. <laughs> and then one night we went out to dinner, me and Dorothy and Denise and Mike went out with Matt. Uh, and uh, I asked him if he'd ever been to the World's Fair. And he was like, oh, my God. And he went off on this whole tear about how much time they spent there. And, and without any prompting from me at all, he said, and when I got home, there was a message from a guy named Roddenberry. And I kicked wow. Mike at the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of our listeners, uh, Mark, he mentions Tomorrowland. And, and I think, well, Mark, you, you could mean that in one of two ways. Uh, obviously, Tomorrowland at Disneyland and Disney World <laughs> is, is trying to, to keep an expression of the future, although it's the, the fantasy version of the future from sort of a steampunk 1930s, but I also yeah, think- Mark, I have to disagree with you there. I don't, I don't know yeah. what era you're talking about in Tomorrowland. Well, well, right now, if you go to Tomorrowland, they, they redressed it into this kind of weird- I'm horrified by that. But you I'm go totally prior horrified to that. By that. Yeah, uh, yeah. When Walt created Disneyland, he was had his Disneyland television show. And yeah. there were episodes about the world of tomorrow and space travel. It was like the man in space- Stuff that you can right. still get in its masterpiece. And like they have Von Braun on there designing rockets and they do missions to the moon and mm -hmm. Mars. And I mean, it, it's, it's just stupendous. And Walt was always very, very, he understood the importance of not fantasy, 
but you know, uh, real world stuff that you might grow up to actually do. Right. He was always interested in inspiring people. And, and, and it, so anyway, back then you could take a trip to the moon at Disneyland. There was a TWA rocket there. It was about the possibilities of where we might actually go. Now it's become like science fiction land. And that's really disturbing to me. Uh, another thing you might want to check out is go and Google uh, Collier's, C-O-L-L-I-E-R-S magazine. And type in Collier's Magazine, Walt Disney, or Collier's Magazine, Warner Von Braun, or Chesley Bonestell. If you guys don't know who Chesley Bonestell is, uh, he was a, a space artist who, he's like the great, he's the dean of all space artists. You have to check him out. Uh, Chesley Bonestell. He was also a matte painter in Hollywood, and he was a well-known architect. As a matter of fact, I have a painting in my living room that's a the uh, Grand Central Tower on Park Avenue, painted by Chesley Bonestell. Uh, but uh, uh, Bonestell and Von Braun and Disney, they all got together and they did all of these little featurettes about man in space, but they also teamed up on the Collier's Magazine articles. And it's pretty much accepted that Walt Disney probably was the guy who convinced the American public that we could do it because of those. those yeah. things. And I, I noticed hearing you mention that, I know that uh, Chesley Bonestell, there is a reference in Star Trek, I believe in Next Gen, because uh, sure. we mentioned it in trivia at one point. So you slip in a, a name like that every now and then. Yeah. It, well, uh, you'll notice, I, I don't know what the, if they're doing it now, but um, you know, between Sternbach and Okuda, and myself, who were really into that, you know, those guys, we slip stuff in there all the time. I mean, like naming a shuttle after Richard Feynman, the physicist, you know. Right. That. Uh, well, uh, since fantastic. Mark mentioned Tomorrowland, and, and and I know that you you might have meant that, but there was also the film Tomorrowland, which I think did a, a really oh, nice yeah, job sure. sort of resetting our interpretation of Tomorrowland yeah. in a non-cynical, non-ironic way to say, here's the relevance of this idea of tomorrow again. And again, using a heavy, heavy design influence from World's Fairs. Well, you and can go from to the, the 64 World's Fair. Yeah, they, of course. They start out there. Yeah. I yeah. was just, you know, I took a half a day off from work to go watch at least the opening of Tomorrowland so I could see what mm -hmm. they did at the World's Fair. Yeah. Um, it, it felt small. <laughs> that was my oh, main really? complaint. It felt small to me. Plus, the other thing was that, and people will say I'm nuts, is I think there's a scene where from, uh, you know, it's a small world that's at Disneyland was mm -hmm. in the Pepsi Pavilion at the 64 mm -hmm. Fair. It's been playing ever since 1964. It hasn't stopped. Yeah. Um, and I believe that the, the, the hero, the kid, goes into that ride and you could just make out through the interior of the waiting area, the New York State Pavilion, which to me was like, go, oh, it's on the other <laughs> side of the park. Of course, who else would know? Right. There's right. some nutty people who know. But, you know, my right. fanaticism about the fair served me well when I was on Star Trek. I was fanatic about keeping uh, Star Trek 100% honest all the time. You know, you, you know, I had this crazy idea that maybe we should talk about Star Trek at some point on this show. I'm, oh, I'm, wondering, I don't know. John, though, I'm wondering, though, do you want to do the thing that we do first and then we'll come back and we'll actually we'll we'll get into the Star Trek bits? OK, we'll we'll do a thing. And then, uh, Doug, you think about Star Trek while we do our thing and we'll come back to you in just a second. All right. OK, do your thing. Okay. <laughs> yes. Doug Drexler is here with us. If you have questions, of course, uh, do all the things that we say uh, that will get you in touch with us, like clicking on the Zoom link or calling the number that we mentioned earlier. And, and I'm going to encourage John to look for that number so he can tell you after we do the thing that we do. Uh, we do want to remind you, though, about our shop. And in fact, we've got some new exciting stuff to tell you about in our shop. We've been teasing for a while that there was new stuff coming or coming if you want to speak English. Um, man alive. I'm really excited about what we've got. Uh, I think we've got some video of it or we should have some video of it coming up pretty soon. New designs. Yeah. Our friend Carl, our friend Carl is just going crazy, cranking out tons of stuff. Um, there are three new shirts or three new designs that we're looking at this week. Uh, Isolinear, Ken and John. Fun fact, that is in fact my personality on a chip. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited about that. Very true. Uh, yeah. Carbon Chauvinism gets a reboot. Da Vinci meets the 23rd century. Kind of exciting there. 
And um, oh, Lieutenant Junior at, J, man. At long last. Yeah, at right? long last. Our, our love of Lieutenant J runs deep. And, and we knew this was such an obvious thing that we had to do. We had our designer, Carl Huber. We just said, look, Lieutenant Junior J, Patrick Nagel. Let, yes. Let's marry these two. And wow, did he marry those two in such a perfect way. Um, it is a stunning design, and we are so happy to be able to present it to you. And our timing could not have been better. Those three new designs, the Isolinear Ken and John, Carbon Chauvinism, and Lieutenant J, they all went up today. And it just so happens that there is a sale going on at T Public. So if you go to missionlogpodcast.com, click on shop, that will take you directly to our shop and the sale prices are automatically recorded there. I'm looking at it now and t-shirts that would normally be $20 are $14. You get to pick your color and um, who, who does not want that Lieutenant J shirt? Not only was I getting response on Twitter from that, people were texting me privately saying, oh my God, that Lieutenant J design is awesome. Yeah, so, and uh, and Tracy's actually seen that, and she's all into it as well. So if you're worried, like yes. I, I wear it, but I don't want to embarrass her, yeah, she's on board. So yeah. we're really excited about that. Uh, really quickly, though, uh, John mentioned timing. Uh, hopefully, you're hearing this before the 19th of April because those sale prices end then. So I guess that's like close of business Thursday is probably when the uh, sale prices stop. But of course, you got those shirts, you got other stuff that we have as well. Uh, tons of things there. Go to missionlogpodcast.com, click on shop, and uh, and yeah, you get a bunch of fun stuff there that you can uh, throw on your back and go to your favorite convention or comic store or wherever. Uh, not hey, unlike you can right now, wearing that Titalics Mining Corporation. Oh, right, shirt. right, right. So yeah. here's what's funny. I keep holding up like the, um, uh, the, the, the sticker and all that stuff. I forgot I have this shirt. I've had this shirt right. for years, actually. And uh, yeah, it works out. I like it. <laughs> yeah. What's yours is mine. Never forget. Right. So we do want to remind people that you can call us tonight, 646-558-8656. You can also click on that Zoom link. It's right there in the comments and right there in the description about the show. Or you can use the one tap from your smartphone and that will connect you directly through. Uh, obviously, Doug has a lot of awesome stories and so much insight into Star Trek, not just from a design perspective, but from the philosophical perspective as well. So great time for you to hop on the line and ask some questions of Doug or, you know, you steer the conversation wherever you want because, uh, hey, it's a live show and, and you can do that. The worst thing we can do is just uh, not answer your question, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> so I've got, I actually, um, I want to launch us into the Star Trek part of it. Um, okay. The Hunger, The Cotton Club, Chud, Starman, Heartburn, Manhunter, FX, <laughs> Making Mr. Right, Fatal Attraction, Dick Tracy. All of those are movies before you start working on Star Trek. All of those are movies that you worked on. In fact, Dick Tracy, you got an Academy Award for, for the makeup work that you did on Dick Tracy. Maybe my thinking is backwards on this, but usually TV is where you start, and then you go into movies. It's obviously a love of Star Trek that you, I mean, that you rack up all of these credits, and I left some out, and then you say, but really what I want to do is go play on the enterprise. That's what it is. That's what it was. Absolutely. <laughs> it's all, it's all I can think about when I was out here. Uh, after Dick Tracy was over, I, I, you know, I went over to Paramount and I literally begged Mike Westmore to let me work on the show. I begged him. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I begged. It was where wow. I was supposed to be. How do I mean? He was there a chance he was going to say no? Because do I need to read all of those things again? Well, it's just you know, <laughs> who knows if they need anybody? Yeah, you know, they may be fully staffed, you know. But I mean, I was, um, there's, I mean, and there's a lot of people out here who can do this, but I, uh, I wasn't just good at you know, creating and putting on makeups, you know, but I was, I was a lab guy too. I knew how to run foam latex and make molds and mix paint and all of that stuff, so uh. Uh, well, <laughs> all I can say is Mike, Mike told me that I could come to work. And in the beginning, it would be a couple of days a week, and then it became more and more and more. You know, uh, you make yourself uh, indispensable, and you also make yourself, uh, you have to be in, in, the, in the movie business and television, you really have to be, uh, your main skill really is your people skills and how you relate to people, talk to people. 
people and make other people feel. They're not going to want to work with you if you're a pain in the, in the butt, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I really think that I've managed to stay busy for like 37 years because um, I, I, I've, I have good people skills and um, I, I spread myself around. I did lots of different things. If makeup slowed down, I could go to the art department. You see, I was gonna... Visual effects, you know, I was able to go to visual effect. Gary Hutzel, you know, called me to come on to Battlestar Galactica. I knew Gary really well from years and years from TNG and Deep Space Nine. Back before CG, if they needed a model, he knew he could come to the art department and me, you know, Mike would call me in his office and we'd make stuff out of, you know, sewage strainers. <laughs> so, See, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask about that. Like, did you end up working in so many different fields because you were trying to make yourself indispensable or was it because, well, okay, well now I know how to do makeup and that's fun, but I, 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 wanna, I wanna go and do this thing well, as well. Yeah, that is exactly how I felt. You know, it was like, I felt like after Dick Tracy and it was like, about 12 years, 11, 12 years as a makeup artist, I felt like I'm looking around and seeing all this other cool stuff. I mean, you got to remember, I'm, I'm a designer. I draw. Uh, I was on, I lived on the Enterprise D. I lived on it when I was a makeup artist. I, day and night, I, I slept on the floor on the Enterprise D. And I had a lot of time to really scrutinize those sets and look at those sets and, and look at the pedigree in the graphics and the design work and say, wow, these people really, they're speaking my language. They really take this super seriously. You know, Andy Probert, Rick Sternbach, Michael Kuda, Herman, they re it really, you could see the dedication in it. It wasn't, and, they, and it didn't look like science fiction. Yeah, it was slick and sleek and stuff like that, but I always felt like they never treated it like science fiction. And that's where a lot of, science fiction goes wrong. It treats it like science fiction. Um, but, but being on stage and seeing all of that stuff, I'm like, oh my God, I want to do some of these consoles and I want to help design. And I, I was blown away by Mike's, uh, Mike Okuda's Okudagrams, the T-Bar graphics, the, the L-Cars graphics blew me away because when I looked at them, I could see the internal logic and how they should function and what it was trying to tell me. And the more I looked at it, the more, you know, I, I hate graphics and science fiction that if you, plus the other thing was that the stuff Mike did for TNG, especially, and on Deep Space Nine too, it's distinctive to the show. You know what I mean? I could look at a science fiction show with a spaceship and those graphics are interchangeable with Hawaii Five-0. Hmm. To me, that's, you're not, you got to give it the style. So that when people see it, it's Star Trek. And that's why you see the L-Cars graphics on people's phones, on their laptops, screensavers. How many years later? Yeah. I've got so, that. It's I've got so that. wonderful. A um, friend of mine made an L-Cars uh, face for my Apple Watch that I uh, that I bust out every now and then just when I feel like. I mean, it it should be, I should be living in the future enough just having an Apple Watch. You would think that's living in the future. But sometimes I want to live a few more years in the future. So I'll bust out the L-Cars. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Car space as well. Hey, we have um, we have a we have somebody who wants to ask you a question. Doug Liam okay. is on the line. Uh, how's it going tonight, Liam? Great. How are you guys doing? Okay. What's uh, hey, what's Liam. on your mind? Well, I'm sorry I missed the first half of your podcast. I'm gonna have to go back and watch it. <laughs> and so if I if I ask something that somebody's mentioned already, I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry but about it. I've had a question for about five years going on in my mind now that I've always wanted to ask Doug. It's a silly little thing. There was a weird door on the set of TNG opposite the brig set. And I don't know what the heck it is. I don't think it's ever been used in the show. It shows up in the background. It must be the head. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the head. You got to have one. Did no, you... I mean, uh... Uh, it, it, if a director ever used it, we know really what it's supposed to be. But it could be an access crawlway. You know, we had doors in engineering that opened like doors that led to Jeffrey's tubes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which I always thought was really cool. Uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, God, it was that was weird engineer. because it's not the same shape as the other doors. I thought it would be the sort of hexagonal doors they have for the holodecks and the and the bigger rooms like the cargo bays. Yeah. But it's like a square red door that's inset into the wall. 
almost like a like a hatch on a would be on an older ship. It's great. And, it's great. Uh, it's great. Uh, Leon, now now you have me. You, you have me very concerned about this now. Leon. I have a question for people who watch. And watch <laughs> who I'm going to go back and watch on? all episodes that have a shot of the brig and that mysterious door. What so. is the Star Trek significance of this hat? Oh, is it Durango's? No, no. I, well, very yeah. important to Gene Roddenberry. Uh, have gun. Yes. Okay. Uh, that is a copy right. of of uh, Paladin. Paladin's hat from the uh -huh. television show that ran from like 1957 to like 1962. It's where Gene Roddenberry cut his teeth as a writer. I've heard people say that oh, Gene hardly wrote any episodes and blah. Gene Roddenberry wrote 24 episodes of Have Gun Will Travel. And that is where Star Trek really was born. And that's why Starfleet is in San Francisco, because Paladin's Hotel was in San Francisco at the turn of the century. Uh -huh. So there you go. There's some, that's some pretty good uh, trivia there. Oh, yeah. That's super cool. I actually have a piece of, of, of earth from Richard Boone's driveway in the hat. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it looks no, like, no. Don't be sorry at all. But, uh, <laughs> I, I know that your house is like a museum of just uh, amazing stuff. Oh, so, right. you know, yeah. I, I got one of Gene's golf clubs. Nice, nice. <laughs> and, uh, very cool. Uh, it looks like, uh, well, oh, Liam, do you have anything else for us tonight uh, before we uh, say goodbye? Um, nothing particularly interesting other than to say that I am totally on board with everything I've heard from Doug so far about the design language of science fiction. Star Trek's L cars is a good example that Michael Kuda genius. designed. It is genius. It's, it, it suits the uh, purpose of the show so well. It fits into things. It's recognizable. Like you said, it doesn't really work as well as I want it to for real user interfaces, mostly because the writing is too narrow. <laughs> well, that's that's it. The writing was actually literally designed by Mike to be not easy to read. That makes because, sense because sometimes they have a close-up shot on a, a console, and you know, you know, you, you it, it has to be a uh, plain. But yeah. Mike used a condensed kind of font so that at a glance you wouldn't exactly know what it was. What, what Mike's graphics did for me was um, well, first the Enterprise was classic overall, the overall design of the Enterprise. But when you see graphics like that on the bridge that are clean and logical, you know, you go to JPL and all the monitors at JPL have the L cars screensavers on them. That's it, awesome. It, it, it makes you believe there's an organization behind this ship and that it's thought out and it's, and, 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 and well-constructed. Uh, when, when I, when I came to the art department, and I got to design. I love it. Mike put me on the Cardassian graphics for the, op, for the for ops. But my big thrill, I was like, oh, I want to do a starship. And then we got the Defiant uh, later on at Deep Space Nine. And uh, Mike was like, have a party. And I went down to the helm and everything. Every button has a purpose. Anyone who looks at it is going to go, whoa. As a matter of fact, when we did Star Trek, the movie, um, when we did Generations, we had the Enterprise B, and uh, the graphics were so beautifully and thoughtfully laid out that uh, the gal who played uh, Sulu's daughter, oh yeah, <laughs> she took one look at it, and she said, can someone come down here and tell me how this works? Because this looks really serious, and I want to know how to use it. Wow. <laughs> That's that's because of the time and thought, uh, you know, and believability that went into it. Which anyone who grew up with Gene Roddenberry knows that the, about the believability factor on the show. It can't be. It can't look that way because it's science fiction. You know, there, there's so many things where you look at it and go, you know, they did that because it's just science fiction. Cool. But Star Trek was never that way. It always seemed like hard science to me, even when they were stretching things. So that's uh, why I think that's enough. Thank you, Liam, so much for calling in. Really appreciate it. And please call back anytime. Thanks, Liam. Um, and, and by the way, speaking of uh, L cars and, and showing up everywhere, there's a, a conversation happening on the Facebook page right now. Meredith says, I may or may not have an L cars comforter. 
And then, uh, and then Earl chimes in, I may or may not have ordered that same set when it was on sale not long ago. So yes, there are many, many bed sheets and uh, pillow sets out there also carrying on the L cars. I just happen to have right here. I just happen to have. Oh yeah, uh, the, the accoutrement. <laughs> but uh, yeah, our friends at uh, Bye Bye Robot did that set with uh, Mike and Denise. Yeah. yeah. So I, I wonder if that mysterious door that Liam pointed out might have an accoutrement saying that it's the bathroom or it might just I, have a. I think device. it's the print shop. I think it's the print. I think it's the, the graphics shop. department, the enterprise graphics department. Good, nice, <laughs> nice. It's every ship has one. Every ship has one. Well, we have Will standing by to chat with us. Will, how are you, sir? I'm great, John. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. Yeah, welcome oh. to the show. And uh, do you have a question tonight for Doug? Hi, Will. Yeah, Hi, Doug. It, it is a pleasure to be here, guys. You know, I've been with uh, these two guys for five years now, and they have kept me thoroughly entertained and. Uh, Pleasure to finally be here live with them. Doug, I've watched your work on Trek Yards. I want to let you know that uh, uh, great stuff because I uh, got into Star Trek in, with uh, Star Trek Three and was interested in the spaceships. And uh, that's what really got pulled me into uh, Star Trek. And I built a site, as a matter of fact, called The History of Star Trek on Consumer Home Video. And it was kind of inspired by, by these two. And uh, the reason why I called in tonight I got excited. I did not know about your connection to the World's Fair. And I wanted to let you know because you made you made a mention and I was instantaneously trying to hook up this system so I could call in because you made a mention that uh, all of the film that you have from that World's Fair has has turned. It's turned red or yeah, it's, it's, all you know, it's, it, it's bad. I believe that I have on eight millimeter uh, two reels from that World's Fair, the making of it, the building of it, the construction of the World's Fair, that's in pristine shape because I have a room, a vault, uh, if you would, that this stuff has been stored in uh, in proper wow. temperature uh, for years. I'm a big film collector and I wanted to let you know if I could find that, and I'm not promising you I will because I can't lay my hands on If I, I can understand. find that, if you're interested, I will send sure. that along. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It is the, it is the construction, the actual physical building of, of, of that fair. There is a, a friend of mine, maybe you maybe you know who he is, a guy named Bill Cotter. And he's done uh, a lot of books on the World's Fair. And he's got a website. Uh, he's got a Facebook page for the New York World's Fair. And you should uh, check it out on Facebook. He's got great pictures and stuff from the fair. And he's also very much into restoring pictures and footage and stuff like that. So if you do find it, you know. That'd be cool. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, that's it, guys. I know time is short, so I'm going to say thanks a lot. I've enjoyed enjoyed listening to your program over the last five years, and it's just been great. I want to say thank you, and uh, I'll have a good night. Uh, thanks so much, Will. Really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Will. Call back whenever you yeah, want. Thank you, Will. Okay. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's what My we do pleasure. here on Mission Log. We, uh, we, we make connections with people. So we're... <laughs> 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 but now that we could do that, that is super cool though i would love to see that film uh so so hopefully that that comes through that is awesome um a lot of people chiming in still in the chat john cooley says does anybody have any idea what the origin uh the origin of my favorite shape in the world the delta came from my hunch is that there's more matt jeffries in it than bill tice ever heard any stories about that well i mean i, I thought it I thought it was Bill Tice who designed it, um, yeah. but I could be wrong. Uh, the thing was that at the time, it was a common shape. It was part of the Googie revolution, you know, the Googie buildings. It was, Googie mm -hmm. was a form of architecture that was very swoopy. And uh, yeah. there were a lot of diners that were built in the 50s, had the Googie look to them. And, and Norm's, were, on, uh, Norm's on La Cienega. Is oh, still absolutely. He probably example. even had shapes. Yeah. Yeah. Like like the Delta, um, the the Delta. Um, if if you Google uh, Googie architecture and furniture, you'll see tables that are almost the same shape as the original series of Delta. Um, but also there was an insignia that was used on the X fifteen, and there was also a NASA insignia. A very early NASA design that you still see it sometimes. It it has this unusual swoopy delta shape going on behind it, and it was actually based on a uh, a, a design for a, 
a vehicle that NASA was working on at the time, and they had actually built a model of it. It was one of the first things that they did, I guess. But uh, I always thought it was an amalgam of those things. That nice. um, not only was it falling in with the idea of the world of tomorrow and the future, you know, I mean, if you look at the Jetsons, you'll see a lot of that reflected, you know. Um, but anyway, that's what I, that's where, I, and as a matter of fact, on my Facebook page, I think in my albums, I have an entire album that is just about that. And I actually have pictures and stuff that I scooped off the internet showing it being used back then. Hey, John, I'm curious. Hey. Um, did you happen to uh, uh, warn uh, Doug about the lightning round? Nope, not at all. Okay. What is well, that? we'll do that in a minute <laughs> and tell you what. Uh, lightning round is coming up, hopefully, if Doug is game, and we'll find out in a moment. But I said earlier that we would talk about a place for podcasts, uh, podcast.roddenberry.com. Uh, you know, time was Roddenberry had one podcast. Uh, it was Mission Log, and you were done. You were just you know, thrown out to find other podcasts wherever you could. And you know how dangerous that can be. Uh, you move ahead a few years, and we have a growing roster of shows. Of course, Mission Log is still going. I think we are in year uh, 37 of our 17-year run. Uh, Mission Log Live, of course, you're soaking in right now. Uh, the Track Files is a weekly deep dive into the files of Gene Roddenberry, hosted by Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek. Women at Warp discusses representations of women in Star Trek, as well as contributions of women behind the scenes. That is a show by women for everybody. And finally, Priority One is your weekly report on the Star Trek multiverse. Uh, they're not going live tonight. So, you know, we're going to let you go here, and then you can just, you know, go out and find wherever you want to on your own. <laughs> I, I, I weep. I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a galaxy of Star Trek podcasts out there. A great place to start your voyage, uh, voyage is podcast.roddenberry.com. And, uh, yeah, so do you want to explain? Here's the thing, Doug. You've been around, you know, a day or two. You know probably what the lightning round is, where we just, like, throw things at you and you throw back your answer just as soon as you possibly can. <laughs> You'll be sorry. <laughs> well, we're, we're willing to risk it, though. Um, you see, this first one's stupid. This one's easy. Uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh, Star Trek. Oh, okay. No comparison. Uh, your favorite uh, Planet of the Apes movie? Uh, well, of course, the original. Okay. It's mm -hmm. such an astonishing movie, and Charlton Heston is so amazing, and those makeups started my career. First makeup I ever did was one of those that John Chambers apes makeups. But I have to say wow. that the War from the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes that just came out, mm -hmm. I was blown away by it. I'd seen the other new ape movies. And I was like, yeah, okay. The apes are amazing, but there were times when I almost cried during yeah. the War of the Apes with the little girl, and yeah, it was it really emotionally. You got to know this little group of apes so intimately, and they were your friends, and you understood them, and you you know fell for them. I was blown away by that. So I have to say, the first one, and the War for the Planet of the Apes. And if you haven't seen it, I had to chase Mike and Denise Okuda around for months. I don't think they believed me. And finally, they watched it, and they were like, it was very moving, several times. Uh, we went over a few minutes ago a huge list of things that you've done, uh, continuing with the lightning round, a uh, project that you wish you had worked on. Did I break Doug? <laughs> well, it's just that <laughs> I, I realized how many things that I got to do that I really, really, you know, wanted to, or to work on Star Trek. To work on Star Trek and turn around and see Gene Roddenberry watching you from a tall director's chair while you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, to have worked on Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. Yeah. Nice. So All right. Uh, carrying on with the lightning round. And by the way, some of these have been submitted in this time since we started the lightning round from our listeners. So uh, uh, first of all, pick a world's fair to visit. Time machine, you pick a world's fair to visit. <laughs> 1964, New York World's Fair. Go, going yes. back to 64. Okay, good. Oh, uh, uh, that, that's the one piece of Star Trek technology I want to take home with me. Transporter. Because I have to go to Cannes and I don't want to fly. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Good answer. Uh, uh, who's your captain? You know what? I love Kirk, and that was my first show, but Picard is so admirable, and we today could learn a lot from Captain Picard. Yeah. Uh, he really, 
to me, he symbolized Star Trek really growing up and getting beyond the 1960s television, you know, fist fight of the week. Yeah. Uh, you know, Picard is an incredible captain. But Kirk, he can't beat the original guys. You know? <laughs> uh, fa- fa- favorite species on Star Trek? Well, Falcons. There you go. As a child, I identified with Spock. You know, um, I... I read and was into science fiction when no one else was, and I was ridiculed for it. And it was like being being chased with torches and pitchforks. They they made fun of you. You were weird, and um, and and I saw Spock on board the Enterprise, especially in the first year, where not everyone was so sure about him, you know. And I kind of yeah. understood that, kind of felt that, you know. And he had to deal with that. I felt like I was different, um, and so Spock was very very appealing. Favorite uh, favorite physical set on Star Trek? You worked on a lot of them. Wait, wait, which bridge? Which yeah. bridge? <laughs> Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no problem. I have two yeah. favorite bridges. Okay. And there's a lot of good bridges. But the two best ones to me are the original, of course. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Even today, you know that it's techn- technologically, it's so far backwards, but it's done with such heart and thought yeah. that you'll just go with it anyway. And then the Enterprise D bridge is oh. a work of art. It is a masterpiece. It is unlike any other bridge that's ever been done for Star Trek. Gene, it was really Andy Probert's baby. Gene wanted something that made a definite statement that we had moved ahead in time. You don't see that. Star Trek gets really confused <coughs> from the original to TNG. <laughs> There was a very definite, <coughs> excuse me, mm-hmm. there was a very definite, that was a message right there, where we were and where we are now. It's a very definite message. After Gene died and we went and we did other ships, it kind of became cockpits again. Not that I don't like the cockpits, but I, I love the statement. The Enterprise D bridge makes a grand statement about who we are, who we were, who we're becoming. It's, it's all really there. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, Last question, the lightning round. Have you been to Vulcan, Alberta, Canada? I have. I have. You have not? Okay. Have that not. question lives on then. You know, I, right. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think Vulcan. what you've been, well, then, okay. That, <laughs> you know, that almost might make it worth retiring that question. <laughs> yes, no, I understand. I understand what you're saying. Yes, but I'm sorry. We were looking for people who had been, you know, far away, but not quite as far as you're talking about. Unfortunately, well, I don't know. Why would I go? What do they have? Hey, don't don't say that, man. Somebody from Vulcan might be watching. There's plenty no of reason to Vulcan, Vulcan has ever invited me to Vulcan. Oh well, maybe that was their mistake. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we did have we. Uh, th- there was one other question I wanted to ask you. Um, we are in a time, and we got like one minute, I think. We're we're in a time now of, of redesign as far as Star Trek is concerned. We we we've had new Enterprise, <laughs> we've had new Klingons, we've had all kinds of new stuff. Is there one thing that if you had your chance that you would like to go in and say, "Man, I want to play with that." Uh, uh, toss that over here because I I got an idea. Something that we've seen before that you'd like to that you'd like to put your spit on. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's actually that's really have, awesome. Honestly, you know, I have very definite ideas about how I think Star Trek should look, how it should go, and I also understand it's science fiction, and they're free to stretch it in many as many different directions as they want. Uh, we had 17 years of Star Trek that I thought, you know, I have not seen Discovery because I don't. I, I one day. Bob Justman came down to TNG because we had a section of the bridge for relics. So he came down to see it. And um, he looked at it and he said, the carpet's the wrong color. (laughs) (laughs) We took him over to the promenade on Deep Space Nine to see it because it's very impressive. Incredible set. And we were all kind of taken back when he said he hadn't seen it. And we're like, really? And he said, it's just too painful. Hmm. And I couldn't understand what he meant. And now I do. I, it's too painful for me to watch it. It's like we kind of got thrown out of our homes. 
and now they gave Star Trek to somebody else, and we're like on the outside looking in. It's and it's it's sad. Um, uh, and I understand where Bob was that day. Now I know. Now I know. Um, I've, I Star Trek is in my DNA. I've done a lot of other stuff though too. You know, I've had a few careers, but Star Trek is though has been one of the overriding things in my life. It's never far from. Me. Well, I, I hate that we have to end this, but we have to end this. I can't thank you enough, though, for, uh, for joining us tonight. And, um, and I, I have to ask if you'll please come back again because I, you know, I could do this for another hour easy. Sure, maybe too. Oh, me too. <laughs> oh, D- Doug, Doug's down the street. I'm going to go sit in his World Spirit. <laughs> I, I, I am. I'm just around the corner from you guys. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm going to yeah, go yell out. out the window, listen for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Mission Log Live is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Executive producer, Rod Roddenberry. Technical production on Mission Log Live by Infinity Network's producer, Brandon Bradley. Be sure to visit podcast.roddenberry.com for the latest from Roddenberry Podcast Network, including Mission Log, but also Women at Warp and Priority One and The Trek Files. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you here again next week. 